adventure for, for foreigners. So, as has been mentioned several times during the meeting already, um, we witness a change in our views on the, on the brain, uh, as if a pendulum swing back from behaviorism to, to gestaltism to some extent. Um, the behaviorist approach stim studying stimulus-response relations over the past decades generated findings that require, I think, an extension of this uh, classical view. And the evidence is mainly that we learn that the conictum of the brain is dominated by distributedness and reciprocity. It has small world properties, as has been mentioned several times. And then we learn that the brain is a self-active system. It's permanently generating highly structured, highly complex spatial temporal activity patterns. And they have been seen in the context of forward models and in the context of predictive coding. So formulating hypotheses, confirming them by uh, using sparse sensory input. Then there is this striking um, conflict between um, first and third person perspective. Um, the brain's intuition about its organization, they differ remarkably from scientific evidence. It's also been mentioned, and you have seen those slides already, in a similar case, the Cartesian view, the dualist stance, a convergence center somewhere in the brain that evaluates all sensory signals, binds them together into coherent concepts, the structure where the self is seated, the structure where intentionality is organized and where plans for the future are structured. The view of the brain, as we see it from neuroscience, is radically different. We see a highly distributed system. What you have here is the central system of the cat, cortex, auditory areas, the dead black dots, visual areas, tactile areas, limbic areas, and they're all interconnected to this extremely complex network of reciprocal connections. So if such a system uh, encounters a polymodal object, I always use the barking dog as an example, uh, all the visual centers become active and analyze the various features and various aspects of this dog, the visual aspects. <clears throat> the auditory centers become active, analyze the various components of the barking sound. If you touch its fur, the tactile centers become active, decode and uh, analyze texture of the fur and so forth. And then the limbic areas also become active and add emotional connotations to um, the dog that is somehow represented here. Is it an aggressive dog? Is it a peaceful dog? What should the behavior, behavioral response be? And the unresolved question is, um, where is the dog in this system? Uh, how is it represented? And um, the conclusion is, there is a cloud of spatial temporal activity that travels here, it's probably trajectories, and this is the not further reducible description of this dog. And this is a problem that we haven't solved yet, and uh, I won't solve it today either. Uh, something on the scalability of the small network properties of the connectome in the brain. We found those simultaneous recordings from columns in the cortex, and it investigates the coupling among those uh, columns by, for instance, computing cross-correlation functions. One gets functional connections of that kind between the various columns. One can replot this in a simpler way, analyze it statistically, and the outcome is it's a small world network that allows optimal communication between any of those nodes with other nodes because there are strategic long-range connections in addition to nearest neighbor connections. The same holds for the connectome of the monkey cortex. This is just the visual cortex, visual areas here as red dots in some executive structures in the frontal and prefrontal lobe, and the white lines here are massive reciprocal neuronal connections. So the same motif in the monkey cortex, and the same motif in the uh, cerebral cortex of the human brain. If one does diffusion tensor imaging to track axonal projections, takes 120 seeding regions, these uh, nodes here, uh, what you see here are connections, and I only plotted 20% of the uh, identifiable connections, and analysis shows it's again the same motif. It's a small world network. Now, these small world networks, they have very advantageous properties. They allow for parallel distributed processing for the one. They allow optimal and uh, fast communication between any nodes. So it's easy to get from the back of the brain to the front and to any place in the brain. And they allow, and this is very important for the coexistence of local processes and globally ordered states into which they are integrated. But in such highly interconnected systems, it is imperative 
to have mechanisms, powerful mechanisms, that allow for the dynamic routing of activity along those uh, anatomical connections and rapid reconfiguration of functional networks. Because if every neuron would hear what any other neuron says at any one moment in time, it would just produce confusion. So <clears throat> we need fast and coordinated adjustments of the connections efficacy on a time scale of tens to a few hundreds of milliseconds in the context and goal-dependent way. And the question is, how can this dynamic coordination be realized? And one possibility would be temporal coordination. And I will be talking mainly about dynamics and temporal variables in brain functions now. If one wants to have temporal coordination, neuronal activity has to exhibit temporal structure. Um, and precise temporal relations between action potentials or synaptic potentials need to be computationally relevant. If not, there is no temporal code. There is ample evidence for temporal structure of neuronal activity. Uh, virtually all networks in the brain that have been analyzed in this respect have been shown to oscillate in various different frequency ranges. And once one has an oscillation, one has temporal passing, uh, one has a clock-like uh, temporal signature. Once one has oscillations, they can synchronize. And this then allows to define phase relations between the activity of individual neurons and the ongoing global oscillations. So there is a coding space opened, which is called phase space, that perhaps is exploited by the nervous system in order to achieve this temporal coordination. Here's an example of how this looks like. Uh, if one records from a cluster of neurons, in this case it's visual cortex, activates them appropriately, they engage in these uh, grouped discharges. The spikes become synchronized among each other. These are different cells. And this is reflected um, by a, a local field potential. The synaptic potentials generate an envelope. And um, when appropriately filtered, you see these fairly regular wave patterns that have been analyzed in the past now quite a lot because it's, it's an interesting signal. And it occurs in all sorts of frequencies in hippocampuses, mainly the theta rhythm, 7 hertz, you know, the alpha rhythm, 10 hertz. Then there is the beta rhythm, is something like 20 to 40 hertz, and then there's the gamma rhythm, 40 hertz and above. Here's an example for the ability of oscillatory uh, or oscillating cell clusters to synchronize if one records from two sides simultaneously, activates them by passing a contour over their receptive fields. It's again visual cortex, runs a cross correlogram analysis. You see these nicely modulated cross correlograms with the center peak indicating that the discharges of the neurons have now become synchronized. What makes this phenomenon interesting is that it is context-dependent and stimulus-dependent. If one activates the two cell clusters with a continuous stimulus, they get both activated and they synchronize. If one activates the same clusters with stimuli, which are clearly representing two different objects, so in this case it's just two objects moving in counterface, cells still respond, as you see from, from the blackness here, this is just counts, but they no longer synchronize. So there's some correlation between the occurrence of the synchrony and the stimulus coherence, if you like. It reflects some of the Gestalt principles that are used for perceptual grouping. Now, is it computationally relevant to have precise alignment of action potentials in EPSPs? With all likelihood, yes, because the dendrites of cortical neurons are exquisitely sensitive to uh, the time of arrival of EPSPs and their relative timing. It makes a huge difference whether EPSPs arrive first on the periphery of the dendrite and then more and more proximally or the other way around because proximal excitation produces proximal conductance changes and events that come from the periphery tend to be shunted and drowned. EPSPs, they occur at exactly the same time. They summate supralinearly and have a great chance of activating active dendritic conductances like calcium channels, which amplifies the signal. And then you probably all know that there is this phenomenon of spike time independent plasticity which translates coincidences, contingencies into synaptic gain changes. And if EPSPs arrive simultaneously or in contingency with a postsynaptic response, a spike, the synapses tend to increase. And this mechanism is very time sensitive. It matters whether uh, EPSPs precede or follow a spike within milliseconds. So there are mechanisms to evaluate sequence order and coincidence uh, in the cerebral cortex. 
Now, I would like to show you one example that suggests that the brain actually uses these temporal um, coding strategies in order to encode uh, certain stimulus features. There is uh, a psychophysical phenomenon. Um, you see that this center grating here has a higher contrast here than here. The reason is that the surround is phase offset. The same is the case here, but here the surround is offset in orientation. Now, it has been shown in the past that this effect is due to an increase of discharge rate of the neurons responding to the center stimulus when the surround is rotated away in orientation because there's less inhibition exerted by the surround. This is the psychophysical function for the increase of contrast with phase offset. So it's a nice and smooth psychophysical function. So what one does is to record from neurons that respond to the center grating here using uh, silicone probes to get many neurons at the same time and then play the game. Here is the confirmation of the um, enhancement of this contrast by orientation offset. When the outer grating rotates away, the discharge rate of the neurons here increases smoothly and mimics the contrast sensitivity function here. Not so if the contrast is enhanced by phase offset. In this case, discharge rates remain exactly the same. So the question is, how is saliency of these responses enhanced if not by increasing discharge rate? And the solution is here. Recording from several cells at the same time allows one to compute cross-correlations and see how coincident the firing is. And the amount of coincident firing is reflected by the amplitude of these center peaks here, of the cor correlogram. And if one takes these as a measure on the ordinate, one sees that there is a perfect match between the increase in synchrony, the red curve here, and the phase offset plotted here on the abscissa uh, for this uh, phase offset constellation. While there is no change no systematic change in synchronization uh, in case of orientation offset. Conclusion being, apparently the cortex uses two complementary strategies to increase the saliency of responses of individual uh, neurons. One is increased discharge rate that makes for better temporal summation. And the other is to make spikes come synchronously. And the, interestingly, the effect is perceptually indistinguishable. So there are two complementary ways to increase the saliency of responses, and this will become important in a minute. Yeah. Um, also, I would like to emphasize that once one has temporal passing of activity, spikes are not just spikes. It matters when they do occur in relation to the oscillation cycle of the population in which they are embedded. The first evidence for this has been provided by John O'Keefe in the hippocampus, who showed that um, place cells, the cells which have receptive fields or response fields for a particular place the animal is in, when the animal traverses this response field, neurons increase their discharge rate, but in addition, they shift their spikes forward in phase relative to the ongoing theta rhythm. And it is this shift in phase, this phase precedence, as it is called, that contains additional information about where the animal is, very precise information that can be read out within a single cycle. So there is a temporal coding strategy in the hippocampus, and there is also in the neocortex, as this slide shows. Um, what visual scientists do, they determine receptive field properties of their neurons using the hubel weasel strategy, passing oriented contours over the receptive field. Cells respond, you count the spikes for, of the response, and you plot them as a function of orientation. Then you get orientation tuning curves, and you can uh, compute an orientation index. And this is what one gets if one takes all the spikes that are produced by that neuron. Um, it's plus minus 30 degree orientations uh, selective. However, if one only takes the spikes that come from, that occur at a particular phase of this oscillation cycle, in this case it's a gamma cycle, orientation tuning is much sharper. So those spikes, there's something special about those spikes, which other spikes more in the other phases don't share. So there is additional information in the, in the phase angle that discharges uh, display relative to the ongoing oscillation cycle. Whether it's used by the brain or not, we don't know. It's a big problem in all systems physiology. We have a lot of correlative evidence. You heard yesterday and the days before that cells fire in response to this and in response to that and in correlation with a particular behavior, but we don't know 
whether this is causally related. Of course, they have to do something, they have to discharge, but most of our evidence is still correlative in nature. You should keep to, have to keep this in mind. I will skip that. Another important aspect of these dynamic properties of the networks is their state dependence. Um, as you will see in a moment, oscillations, especially in this high frequency range, are extremely sensitive to state. They are enhanced by arousal, they are enhanced by expectancy, and they are enhanced by attentional mechanisms. And all this can occur independently of modulations in the discharge rate. So it seems that there are two orthogonal ways of modulating the system. Here's an example. Early days, a little kitten with a matrix electrodes implanted, so one can compute cross correlations between the discharges, watching a drifting grating on a screen. And um, in the beginning, the kitten is interested because something new. So the EG shows a lot of power in the high frequency range. And if one runs cross correlations between those neurons, you see this wonderful oscillatory modulation of the discharges. They, they come in, in groups. This is not the grating causing these groups. It's an endogeneously generated rhythm. Now with time, uh, the kitten gets bored, still keeps the eyes open, but the EG shifts towards lower frequencies. And the, this synchronization um, decays until it disappears completely. Kitten still eyes open, cells still responding to the stimulus, everything fine at this single cell level, but the global coordination is gone. Some of the systems, and I haven't got the time to go into details, have been identified that control this state variable. Uh, they are related to the ascending reticular arousal system. They use acetylcholine as a transmitter. So there's a projection from the basal forebrain that uh, supplies cortex with uh, acetylcholine. If this is lesioned or pharmacologically blocked, gamma oscillations are gone uh, and are not uh, rescued. And another pathway is through the interlaminar thalamic nuclei. They have been mentioned yesterday by Mike Shadlin as, as modulatory systems that control the state of cortex. Now, one can show the same thing in a wake behaving monkey. Um, monkey is trained to fixate and then attend covertly to patterns that appear in the receptive fields of the neurons that one is recording from. And the monkey knows through cueing or blocking the trials that a change will occur either in the second pattern, in which case the monkey has to respond here, or a change will occur only in the third pattern, and then he has to respond here. Then one records from a number of neurons at the same time, runs cross-correlation analysis, um, plots the amount of correlation, i.e. precision of oscillations, uh, in color, the hotter, the, the better synchronized, the more oscillations, on the ordinate frequency range of these oscillations, and here the time of the trial. In this case, monkey expects the change to occur after the second pattern. So what monkey does, it upregulates its oscillatory activity in response to the second pattern, getting ready to act, but this was a catch trial, nothing happened. So the monkey maintains its attention and expectancy, maintains these oscillations, also in response to the third stimulus, and then responds, and then everything breaks down. In this case, monkey expects the change to occur after the third stimulus, and you see it doesn't, doesn't even bother to engage its cortex in oscillatory activity, which does not mean it does not respond. The cells do not respond. Actually, the cells do respond. This is the increase in power in this gamma frequency range when, when the monkey expects something to occur as compared to unexpected. But when you look at the discharge rates of neurons that respond to those patterns, there is no change. So something is going on that escapes analysis of single cells and is only visible if one looks at, at global patterns and looks for synchrony. So since those two variables, discharge rates and the coordination, the temporal coordination of discharges are regulated independently, they could in principle be used for different purposes. And I will come back to that. Um, yeah. You read it. Um, by adjusting the phase and the synchrony of oscillatory activity, one can, in principle, gate communication between nodes. And the finding is that if one records simultaneously from different nodes or columns um, and they oscillate, the phase with which they oscillate, they shift. 
and they, they explore the whole phase space available, as you see here in this phase plot. But there is some preferred phase for every couple of uh, uh, clusters. And the hypothesis that one can derive from this is that if two clusters oscillate with the same frequency in phase with zero phase lag, um, and I should say, when a neuron goes through this oscillatory cycle, there is a, uh, a period where the neuron is very susceptible to input. It's close to firing level, it's depolarized, it's very susceptible to EPSPs. But then when it goes down into the trough, and these are regularly alternating cycles, there's very strong uh, GABAergic inhibition here which shunts the dendrites and the neuron is virtually insuscept unsusceptible to, to excitatory input. So. The idea is if two neuron clusters oscillate at the right phase so that this neuron is susceptible when it receives the message from this neuron and vice versa, they will couple very intensely. While another node that happens to oscillate out of phase will be refractory when the message from this node comes and vice versa, so they should not be coupled. And one can measure this by recording simultaneously from two nodes, measuring the coupling by computing mutual information or, or the covariation of, um, of discharge to see whether they talk to each other or not. And the quality of talking or the intensity of talking to each other is color-coded here. Here is the, the phase relation through which these clusters migrate uh, over time. And here's the frequency range in which this communication occurs. And you see that if phase enters this, uh, we call it just arbitrarily zero phase, it needn't be zero phase, but this is the one that this cluster prefers, they start to couple very intensely. And this occurs on the basis of these high frequency gamma oscillations. It's, it's reserved for this frequency range. It does not happen for the lower frequencies. And it is a general phenomenon. It is seen in primary visual cortex of cats at this frequency range. It's seen in monkey V1, primary visual cortex. It's seen in monkey V4. has been studied in other areas, but I would suspect this is really a general principle. So conclusion being, in practice, coupling can be modified dynamically at a very fast time scale by adjusting oscillation frequency and phase. These are variables that can be regulated dynamically very, very rapidly. Without having to change synaptic gain or, or to do some metabolic changes, it's just in time, temporal alignment decides whether you talk to each other or not. This obviously would permit selective routing of activity through this highly interconnected network, and I will give you an example. And so it establishes transient relations between nodes, so to configure ad hoc, on the fly, functional networks. Whether it's a novel computational strategy, again, correlative evidence would say yes, causal evidence not present yet. Here is an example how this works or how this could work. Cats have been trained to look at the stimulus, uh, in this case a grating, wait until it changes its orientation a little bit, then uh, press a door and then be rewarded if they do it within a sufficiently short period of time. These cats were implanted with chronic electrodes that allowed one to record uh, multi-units and the field potential in defined cortical areas, primary visual cortex, parietal association area. This is a little bit the LIP that uh, Mike Shedlin talked about yesterday. So about the sensory cortex and finally the motor cortex related to the paw that the animal needed to use. If one then runs cross correlations between the activity in these areas, one finds that indeed all those areas have the capability to synchronize their respective oscillatory activity, as you see in this, in this graph. There, there's always some cross-correlation here between area 5 and uh, area 5 lateral, 5 medial, and so forth. Now, the interesting part of this is, how does this change as a function of the behavioral cycle? And let me start with this example. Here, the animal is feeding. Here's a solved this task. And what you see, this is a sliding window cross correlogram. So this is the center peak here. And these are the, the troughs, and these are the side peaks. It's essentially a cross correlogram put upside down and plotted in color. So when the animal feeds, there's slow wave oscillation. It's in the something like in the, in, the, in the low alpha range, and it's phase shifting all the time. So it's nothing systematic to be seen here. But back here is a buzz that alerts the animal that the next trial will start. What the cat does, it turns around, 
and it waits for the stimulus to come. And this is this phase. Stimulus isn't there yet, but what you see is a strong, very precise synchronization in the uh, here beta frequency range um, in anticipation of the stimulus to appear. And this is between, you see this between all the areas that the cat needs to engage in order to solve their task, primary visual cortex all the way up to motor cortex. When the stimulus appears, it becomes even more crisp and precise, and then the animal distinguishes the movement, responds, and then it breaks down again. And this is repeated over and over again. So you see how at the dynamic range, things can be adjusted very, very quickly uh, using um, oscillation frequency and phase to coordinate the activity in anticipation in these areas. Um, putative function, it could be selective routing of signals between the areas that have been selected to have, that will have in the future to collaborate. Um, and this could allow rapid handshaking because it could exploit the mechanism I've just been talking about that if a message is sent from A to B, if B is in the susceptible state, it will immediately understand it and not hear other messages at the same time. Now, you wonder what does all this have to do with consciousness? <laughs> I needed to go there in order to, um, to sensitize you for, for the putative importance of temporal coordination. So how do we proceed when we look for the neuronal correlate of consciousness? We create perceptual conditions in which targets are presented that are sometimes perceived consciously, that we are aware of, that are reportable, and in other instances, um, they pass undetected. We keep the physical conditions as constant as possible. We measure neuronal responses in both conditions. We subtract them from each other, and the difference is then considered as a neuronal correlate of consciousness. But there are a lot of problems. The major problem is that whether it's seen or not may be due to some fluctuations of the signal-noise ratio in peripheral visual structures. Sometimes the signals will make it, sometimes they won't make it. Maybe we pick up these fluctuations in our different computations. They would precede the moment or the processes that actually are required for access to consciousness. But we can't distinguish between those two very readily. Then, if something has become conscious, it becomes reportable, uh, it gets into short-term memory. So there are processes afterwards that are very relevant, and they also produce brain signals, and they would show up in the difference difference between seen, aware, or unaware. In the moment, most of the studies lump all this together, so we cannot be really sure what actually we are, we are looking at. One can make some educated guesses from latencies, but um, since we don't exactly know when things enter consciousness, this is difficult. So this should just indicate that it is very, very difficult to dis <laughs> distill the neuronal correlates of consciousness. Uh, there are essentially two competing hypotheses, and you have been confronted with some of them. One is that there be specific areas that need to be engaged in order to make something conscious, or that there is a particular dynamic state of the whole system that distinguishes conscious from non-conscious processing. And I would like to give you an example for the latter hypothesis. The experimental procedure is, as I just uh, said, um, one produces stimuli that are sometimes visible, sometimes not, and then one measures some brain variable. In this case, it's magnetoencephalographic measurements in human. And then one analyzes spectral power of, what, of these signals and, and their coherence, their phase synchrony. So here is the experiment. S subjects are presented with a sequence of letters, um, which are masked. And sometimes they see them, sometimes they don't see them. Um, and at the end of the trial, uh, they have to do a um, forced choice matching operation say, same or different. Now, it's a bit strange for the subjects because in cases where they are not aware of what they had seen, um, they would say, well, I, how should I know? But we say, nevertheless, guess, do something. And it turns out if there is match, reaction times are shorter than if there is non-match, indicating that the, the brain has seen something, has decoded it all the way down to semantic depth because it also works if one shows a cat or a dog, but the, the, the person as a whole is not aware of it. In other cases, they perceive and they say, yeah, I was dumb. So if one compares spectral power between the two conditions, there isn't much difference. Local gamma oscillations that occur during those tasks are quite OK. There's a little bit more uh, in the, in the uh, matching phase just preceding the response phase. Um, but this is much too late in order to be considered as a NCC.
your correlate of consciousness. The interesting phase is, is up front here, because this is where one recognizes. And what one sees if one, rather than computing uh, amplitude fluctuations of these waves and their frequency, um, computes phase locking, so the precision with which they can synchronize uh, ac across areas, over distance between the two hemispheres or between different uh, sources. And here is a brief moment. Uh, you see this here, this dot. That's, that's the important thing. Um, this is a moment about 180 milliseconds after the stimulus has been shown where many sensors phase lock in this case, in the beta frequency range. It's a transient phenomenon, disappears again, it's no longer seen in the difference, which is only there when the, when the subjects have consciously seen something. One can then plot a graph that indicates which sensors, or in this case in source space, um, have talked to each other, or have synchronized for that brief moment. And this is at a particular point in time, uh, you see this network emerging, given a certain threshold in process, uh, which does not emerge when the subject haven't seen it, suggesting that one prerequisite for conscious processing, but with all the caveats that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, could be the transient and precise synchronization of a widely distributed ensemble of cortical neurons in the gamma or, if it's long-range, beta frequency range. Now, this, this interpretation is, of course, in agreement with the hypothesis of bars on, on a global workspace, as we heard yesterday in the video uh, conference. And nothing is new in the world. Uh, Sherrington has already uh, speculated on something like that because he was concerned with the unity of consciousness and how could one bring all those different signals in the brain together in order to have a coherent percept and to be aware of something that is coherent. And he said it, you don't need convergence in space to do that. He said pure conjunction in time without necessarily cerebral conjunction in space. So he meant converging pathways lies at the root of the solution of the problem of the unity of mind. We'll see whether he's right. Um, maybe I skip that for the sake of time. You know, there's another interesting paradigm used in consciousness research. This is binocular rivalry. You have uh, identical physical stimuli on the two eyes that cannot, well, since I'm talking about it and I have another seven minutes, to talk or to discuss, to talk. Ah, that will be okay. So. Um, if stimuli in the two eyes cannot be fused, um, then there's always one eye suppressed because you don't want to have double images. Or the, and this we do, we do automatically all the time because beyond the point of fusion, the panum's area, you always would have double images. So normal viewing is always associated with repressing signals that cannot be fused. And the two eyes usually alternate in doing this. So um, exposing a cat to rivalrous stimuli, this case gratings uh, that drift in different directions, um, they either see this one or that one and one knows which one they actually see because they produce a nystagmus and the direction of the nystagmus tells you what they actually see, what flow field is inducing the nystagmus. So we have an external control on which eye is leading and then play the same game again. All this can only be done with multi-site recording. I can't emphasize this enough. You wouldn't see anything of this with single cell recording. You can compute correlations between the neurons, and what you see is when neurons that lose out in competition, that are fed by the eye, that is not making it to consciousness or to awareness, the synchrony goes down while it goes up in neurons, and it goes up dramatically in neurons that supply the information that is later on perceived by the animal. Could be a simple mechanism just increasing the saliency of the signals coming from the eye that is controlling behavior, uh, making neurons more synchronously active increases saliency because of the coincident sensitivity of the target neurons. You saw an example for saliency enhancement by synchronization. But it could also be that these neurons get bound into a large assembly uh, that is synchronously active across processing stages and that this is the entry ticket to access to consciousness. But we can't distinguish. Interesting, again, in Peripheral visual structures like the primary visual cortex, these changes go along without systematic changes in discharge rate. You wouldn't be able to tell by looking at the discharge rate of individual neurons whether it is part of the ensemble that makes it to consciousness or not. 
You only find it if you look at the dynamics of the interactions. So, I have interpreted this. And now, just one brief excursion. Yeah, I have enough time. Using measures of synchrony and phase locking as diagnostic tools for the analysis of functional networks. You had already seen this in the SCAT experiments. It tells you something about the, the handshaking of areas in anticipation of something. So we thought, and this is why I put it in, there are altered states of consciousness, obviously, and in schizophrenic patients, this is very clear that this is the case. It's addressed as such. And the question is, does that correlate with disturbance in temporal coordination? Can one find a variable? Why schizophrenia? Because this is a disease that is characterized by the inability of the patients, as far as the negative symptomatology is concerned, to bind together what needs to be bound together. They have fragmented perception of the environment, or sometimes they establish false bindings. They associate things with each other that normal people wouldn't. So maybe there's something wrong with the dynamic coordination in this system. So the experiment goes as follows. One shows normal subjects and patient groups, uh, these Mooney faces, ask them, do you see a face or not, and if, press. And um, this requires a lot of coordination because one has to, to, to complete and bind the right contours to each other. So it takes some time until one can see them or not see them. And then there are uh, fake patterns where it's impossible to see something because they have been fragmented. Recording EEG, MEG, doing source analysis, showing the sources where the activity goes up during this task, and um, it goes up in the occipital part of the brain, as one would expect. And then analyze power of oscillations in different frequency ranges, so frequencies plotted on the ordinate, time runs here, moon faces are presented here, and color is again indicating, temperature indicating the, the, the power of the oscillations in a particular frequency range. And you see that in normal subjects there's a fairly strong increase when the processing begins, sometimes it's lost in the retina and some pre-processing, but then these oscillations start and uh, this is then the end of the, the trial, the response occurs somewhere back here. This is the normal pattern. This is what one finds in schizophrenic patients. There's less of all this. It's there, but there's less of this. This is not due to medication only because one also sees this decrease in um, first admission non-treated uh, subjects significant, but is, is less pronounced than in the chronic schizophrenics. Whether this is progression of disease or drugs, we don't know. What is more interesting than the power changes is if one again looks for the precision of synchrony, the coordination among the areas. So what you see here in color, uh, in temperature plot, is, is not amplitude, it's the precision of phase locking, of this coordination. And this is what you get in normal subjects, and this is in the, as you see in another frequency range, it's in the beta range. These long range coordination things occur at lower frequencies. And this is nearly missing at this threshold level in schizophrenic patients. And the deterioration of this phase locking ability correlates significantly with uh, the symptoms that have been rated independently by the clinicians. One can again then plot these graphs of these interaction graphs. And this is what normal subjects produce when they do this Mooney phase analysis. And this is what the schizophrenic patients do at the same threshold level. So there's a deficiency in their ability to, to precisely coordinate uh, local processes that are oscillatory, um, but occur at different sites. So they have a problem with functional network formation. Hypothesis, maybe this lack of coordination is one cause of the dissociative symptoms they have. Um, we don't know, but at least it gives us now an indication like an endophenotype to search for certain mechanisms because we know very precisely who generates these high frequency oscillations. It's networks of garbage interneurons. And we also know very well who is responsible for the long range coordination of this activity for the synchronization, the garbage system. And, and disturbances in both um, are known um, indirectly um, because some of the genetic markers that increase the disposition to become schizophrenic, they target either the GABAergic system or the glutaminergic system. So this could perhaps unify those quite divergent findings. This brings me to the end. Unresolved questions, more than we have data 
Um, are we just examining how contents enter consciousness and say nothing about consciousness? Then can we separate being conscious uh, from being aware of something? What we study most is being aware of something. And uh, Mike Shadley made a distinction yesterday between the psychological consciousness and the neurological consciousness. Most of this is here. I don't know exactly what it is. Um, and then the other question is, can there be consciousness without content? Um, expert meditators would say, yes, of course, there is. Um, and all those, even if we solved those questions, we still wouldn't solve the hard problem. And my, my hunch is it will just disappear as we get an, another view of the brain. It will become an, a, a problem that we brought into the world because we talk, we thematize, we categorize, and we assign, um, we assign qualities to each other. Now, the question that I would like to close with is, will we understand the brain once we have a full description of the responses of individual neurons? This is what most of us do. We analyze the responses of individual neurons in correlation to a particular behavior. Now, one can predict what we'll find for every behavior that we are capable to produce. We will find a place in the brain and the neuron that is somehow correlated to this behavior. If not, uh, a reductionist approach would fail. But is this enough? Have we then understood enough? I doubt it, and the question is whether we have to enter this still very poorly understood world of complex self-organizing systems that exhibit nonlinear dynamics, and in such systems, relationships matter. It's not the individual uh, element that matters, it contributes, but the bulk of the information in such systems is contained in the relations, spatial and temporal which can, of course, only be analyzed if one looks at the system as it looks at itself, simultaneously at many different places. Because in, in, in such systems, a relation has the, the status of an object. It is not just a description, it is really uh, causally related to future functions. And this is where I would like to leave you. Okay, thank you.